Hey, it's me, your kitchen. I know you've been cooking in me a lot more than normal, and I'm getting a little dirty, and cleaning me isn't the most fun, but you know what could make cleaning me a whole heck of a lot more fun? While you're cleaning, listen to an episode of this podcast. Before I continue my first ever journey through the Harry Potter series, just a few quick announcements. First, this is the first episode of Potterless in September, meaning that it is donation time. Here at Potterless, each month we donate $1 for every member of our team over at patreon.com slash Potterless to a different charity. And at the time of recording, we have 920 patrons meaning we'll be giving $920 to the California Community Foundation, specifically their wildfire relief fund. So you may have seen that across California and some other parts of the U.S., there are some pretty bad wildfires going on. And this fund not only helps with the immediate disaster relief, but also long-term recovery efforts for those that are affected by these wildfires. It is devastating to see, and I just appreciate that this foundation and this fund is helping people stop these fires from spreading and also to offset some of the damage, the lasting damage that they cause. If you want to learn more about this particular fund, you can go to calfund.org slash wildfire dash relief dash fund. Also just wanted to take this time to say that Potterless has an Instagram account, a Twitter account, a Facebook page, a Facebook group, a subreddit. There are so many different social media worlds that we are involved in. I have a very fun time running all these accounts and interacting with people. So whatever is your preferred social media, come through, say hi, meet some Potterless listeners, talk to me. It's a fun time. Twitter.com slash Potterless pod, Instagram.com slash Potterless podcast, Facebook dot com slash Potterless and reddit dot com slash r slash Potterless. And speaking of fun communities of people, we have new patrons to welcome to our Patreon team. So shout out to Luca Schumacher, Acacia Raffle, Casey Pontrelli, Anna Martin, Berta Fuchs, Amanda Callender, and Emily Sollinger. Shout out to Violet Sullivan, who upgraded their pledge. A huge shout out to Eileen Gazesh, Annette Pipitone, and Kirsten R. Cunningham, who upgraded to the producer level status, as well as our newest producer level patron, Ann Peltzer. They joined the ranks of Vicky Christine, Aaron Clown, Marchismo, Samantha Juan, Rosemary, Marie, Lisa Romina, Audra Eleanor, Nikita, Ali, Sarah, Rachel, Zachary, Orchid, Vivian, the Owl, Poster, Alex, John, Noel, Brandon, Claire, Rory, Veronica, Lada, Noah, Tracy, Colleen, Jennifer, Justin, Jacob, Maya, Mark, Polly, Zena, Harlan, Noelia, Nikki, Kine, Amanda, Kafir, Sarah, Marta, Maya, Flor, Siri, Georgia, Skyla, Adele, Professor, Threat, Ellie, Michael, Kelly, Carrie, Connie, Jen, Nedry, Will, Samantha, Aurora, Marcos, Marik, Ashton, Brittany, Phelan, The Meadows Family, Ginny, Heather, Brianna, Kevin, Lori, Chrissy, Jarl, Peter, Sophie, Jen, and Callahan, Leah, Melissa, Bella, Melanie, Becca, Rees, Adam, Joseph, Lily's mom, T Run, Madison, Tonk, Sabrina, Sophia, Farzan, Melanie, Matt, Okamahime, Boney, Pony, Kelsey, Rike, Taylor, Rochelle, Megan, Alicia, Riley, Laurel, Ross, Anne, Erica, Miranda, Landon, Kendra, Callista, Kendra, Natanya, Yogan, Darcy, Sandra, Craig, Andren, Steve, Lior, Julia, Demi, Michelle, Callista, Lovekesh, Jennifer, Crystal, Henrique, Jeremy, Delkis, Katrina, Jerrica, Casey, Megan, Zat, Jack, Sophia, Dan, Rochelle, Kirsty, Robin, Chick, Mermaid, Daddykins, Aaron, not my daughter, you, Piaccia, Laria, Lori, Gregory, Krista, Kaka, Nina, Ribbon, Brittany, it's definitely Ludo, Bagman, Ravenclaw, Gavin, Ashley, Grant, Aaliyah, Jack, Serenity, Emily, Haley, Sabrina, Malfoy, Sean, Jenny, Laura, Ella, Steamed Nuggets, and Can't I Potter? Who never lose their laundry card for their machines in their apartment building meaning that they have to buy a new laundry thing and waste $5 plus whatever was left on their laundry card from before. If you want to be like one of these amazing patrons and get access to bonus content like monthly live streams, Discord, exclusive merchandise, director's commentary, my notes, and more, you can head on over to patreon.com slash Potterless. But without further ado, let's get into episode 142 of Potterless, a very special interview with Jamie Lynn Beatty from Star Kid. Hello, Internet, and welcome back to another episode of Potterless, the tale of a grown man who never read the Harry Potter series as a kid. He read them as an adult, and then he watched a whole lot of four-hour-plus musicals. My name is Mike Schuber. I'm that man, and I'm here joined today by a very special guest, someone that was in those musicals. It is Star Kid team member Jamie Lynn Beatty. Jamie Lynn, how's it going? Hello. It's so nice to cyber meet you in the ether. It's wonderful. <laughs> as we mentioned before recording, we've probably crossed paths at Leaky Cons, but didn't know it, but you know, we're making up for lost time now. Indeed. I think we were friends in a past life. That's yeah. That's what I've settled on. Yeah, I think that works for sure. So I'm very excited to have you on the podcast. It is something that was not planned, but thankfully I checked my Instagram DMs and you had just shot the shot and just said like, hey, I have a lot of answers to these questions you've been asking in your podcast. I'm happy to answer them for you. So did someone show you the podcast? Like, how did this come about? I'm just curious. I had looked through some messages and after the fact realized that people had been messaging me being like, they're talking about you guys on this podcast. Like you should listen. And I didn't think anything of it. And then I met up with Corey Lubowicz, who is also one of the like founding 
original Star Kid members. And he was like, oh, yeah, they're doing this Harry Potter rewatch of this person who's never seen the show before. And truly, what intrigued me most about that is I was, A, it was quarantine, and I was like, I'm bored of the internet. Like, what, <laughs> what else is there out there? Let me go to the pseudo-internet podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love podcasts. That's a whole other thing. Anyway, and truly, what fascinated me most about it and, and only after the fact that I, that I then see that there had also been messages from fans who were like, you should check this out. And so I was like, oh, there is some validity to this. But what I, like I said, what fascinated me most was you had never seen them. And that to me was such a fresh perspective because in the now, oh my gosh, almost 11 years since we did it, I have had the pleasure of meeting people who know the show so well that it was, I was curious to see what, a fresh perspective was like in 2020 because it was it, it's I'm a curious creature and <laughs> yeah, anyway it's a whole it's a whole thing <laughs> <laughs> no, that's awesome. my curiosity got the best of me and I was just you seemed like a a cool guy so I was oh I, I try to be <laughs> or at least a big nerd but yeah I think that's I think that's part of like honestly what made Potterless just the podcast work is a different perspective so I'm glad I could uh, be a new perspective too I'm also very glad that all of the episodes were recorded before you messaged me. So, like, there's no lying that in audio form, I'm like, the girl who plays Ginny's voice is like, she's got some pipes. And that was like a completely non-biased, not just saying that because you messaged me kind of thing. So I'm glad that I can, like, live in the comfort of knowing I said nice things about you before you messaged. That's <laughs> very kind. I admittedly did not listen to all of them. So all the mean stuff you said, I didn't hear. So you're you're in the clear. <laughs> Goes back and edits every episode where I was like, she sucks so much. <laughs> she's the worst person in the cast. But it was, it was just wild for me to hear. I specifically specifically listen to the one that uh, Melissa and Nellie was in because I haven't heard ah. from Melissa in so long. And, and that was nice to hear her voice again because that brought back so many memories. So it was equally a trip down memory lane for me. And if you know me, my friends can tell you I am a sucker for nostalgia. And I kind of famously in our group of friends, I have a saying that's like, tours over, which is that when we were on tour doing Apocalypse Tour and Space Tour, I would anticipate the ending of tour once tour started, like on day two. I was like, tour's almost over. And so I feel like I've always been very precious with my memories with everything. And so when I find moments in my life that make me happy, I like to revisit them because it it brings back the joy. And Lord knows we need a lot of joy these days, so. We definitely do. We definitely, definitely do. Well, I'm glad this is happening. I have a whole bunch of questions that I've already formulated over the course of just making the podcast and asking them into the ether, and now you can clear those up. I can only answer based on my experience. <laughs> there are still so many things that confound me, both in the whole series of Harry Potter and and, and life itself, so. <laughs> So let's first get the Star Kid of Harry Potter what the heck questions cleared. Thankfully, I got some of these cleared up, but the first one that I have that did not get resolved, I've heard conflicting reports about the giant Hershey's bar. I've heard reports that like there was a $150 budget and the bar was like 50 bucks. I heard reports that uh, one of the Star Kid's parents gave the chocolate bar. Do you know the history of the chocolate bar? So the history, <laughs> great question. This is really the main <laughs> takeaway, I think, from the, the musical. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all of my questions are going to be incredibly silly. <laughs> Please. I don't think I can answer. I, I enjoy I enjoy talking about chocolate and food. That's all I think about, to be honest. I would rather ask, and I want to do this anytime <laughs> I can interview anyone that is like Harry Potter tangential or someone that was in the movies. Like, it is a goal of mine to ask questions that people don't often get. Because I've even got like the same questions a million times about the podcast. So I can only assume people are like, so how'd you get involved with Star Kid? Like, you're tired you of know it. No one's asked that. <laughs> if my memory serves me, Nick Lang is one of the writers. His parents had gone to, I believe, like Hershey, Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. like to the actual place where Hershey bars are invented and made magically. And it was given to him as a gift. And I think he had it just lying around. And much like so many other things in this show, we just kind of, because it happened so accidentally, right. <laughs> like none of the, none of anything beyond the 
three, four days that we did the show was ever supposed to happen. This show was supposed to happen and then never exist again. And so he had a large chocolate bar lying around and was like, sure, we'll put it in the show. It's Hogwarts. They have magical food there. They would have an <laughs> oversized chocolate bar. It's, that's how magic works. So it was a nice upcycle of a gift. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. And then I can assume there was just one and it was just partially eaten and covered up over the course of the multiple runs. Like you didn't get four fresh ones, did you? No, no. Oh, no, no, no. And that's why Joey Richter, who plays Ron, made some pretty decent progress. I want to say, knowing Joey, he loves candy. I could uh, tell. <laughs> <laughs> um, Joey ha has always had a sweet tooth. I, I want to say that he accomplished... The, de the devouring of the chocolate bar entirely on his own over the course of the run. I don't think there was any like breaking of a corner to start it. Like I, I would like to confidently say that he took a bite one day, probably during rehearsal and what you see is, is real time progress of eating a Hershey <laughs> bar the size of a small child. <laughs> <laughs> it is so wonderful. I love it. I do appreciate how much Ron snuck eating into it. And yeah, if you're saying it's because of Joey Richter's sweet tooth, that would be like me if I was in some play being like, guys, I think my character really likes peanut butter and should be eating peanut butter in every scene. Like, I think we should find a way. It speaks to me. <laughs> oh, yeah. I think if, if I ever, you know, write really anything, I think I will, uh, from, na from now on, I'm going to make sure that there is food written into the scripts so that it has to be, it's part of the prop list. Because then you automatically just get your favorite food. It's pretty sweet. <laughs> I'm eating like Cool Ranch Doritos in it. Like I think I got aboard the snack train. I was like, oh wait, we're allowed to do this? <laughs> Plus it's just fun to eat on stage because it's the most real thing you can do. Like there's no faking eating, at least not for me. If yeah. I'm giving food on stage, I will... 100% devour all of it. <laughs> yes, 100%. Now, speaking of Ron, this is something I also wondered about. The headband that he wears, was it because the wig couldn't stay on his head or was it a separate choice of like, sure, Ron should have a headband? Much like the Hershey's chocolate bar, which had already existed in our lives, the headband, if I remember, Joey had been to a... 1980s workout themed college party. Great party. We Great know those. Theme. We've all been to those. We've we were all invited to that. <laughs> Leg warmers, vibrant colors, crop tops. We Everything all Everything from it. American Apparel, even though that didn't exist in the 80s. <laughs> um, he, so he had that lying around. And the original one obviously did not say Star Kid on it. Now that Ann Arbor T-shirts has made it, it they cleverly branded it to say star kid, but he had it lying around and was like, well, I think you are right. And and again, you are helping jog my memory. I think it <laughs> did probably have something to do with the physics of the wig, maybe, or it could have honestly just have been, this is a fun character choice. There were such low stakes for the show that we wanted it to be fun for us. And so Joey and I were also in an improv group together at that same time. So it was just like, what can we do that just brings another level of silliness to this world. That's fun. I appreciate the headband to keep hair out of the way. I, I only in the past couple of years have become a, a longer hair boy and it is normally like done up and stuff. But uh, I have multiple NBA headbands when I just am walking around the house. So it could have just been a keep this longer wig out of my eyes maneuver as well. I mean, I'm literally wearing a headband today because my bangs looked awful this morning. And I was like, <laughs> I cannot let Mike see me like this. Don't worry. Audio podcast for everyone listening. You're killing it. You look great. You're glowing. <laughs> I, I appreciated the opportunity to put on a bra this morning. That's but <laughs> haven't done that in months. Honestly, that's that for for me. Obviously, I do not have to have to deal with that whole situation. But yeah, I I have gone to like oh, it's an important day because I did my hair or shaved. Uh -huh. That's like a big <laughs> big oh, I have something where someone has to see my face. Also, thinking about props that were just lying around, Ginny wore bright yellow shoes in the first show, which was also like a very strange choice if you consider what the Hogwarts outfit was. Like, I think they even specifically, the costume designer was like, if you have black shoes, like, please bring those. We all pretty much DIY'd our costumes for the most part. There were, they had like some basics that were given to us, but we were told to like, bring a collared shirt if you have it, bring black shoes if you have it, bring basics. And I didn't own any black shoes. So I was like, Perfect. Bright yellow shoes. That's the next <laughs> best choice. 
And I think so many people over the years were like, mm, that was a that was an intentional choice. Like, what is she saying? Is it a <laughs> is it a subtle reference to Mickey Mouse? Is it, you know, what is this? And I was just like, I didn't own any black shoes. These were the most basic shoes. <laughs> <laughs> I will say in my watching, I did appreciate the shoes. I figured it was probably just you wore whatever you had kind of thing. But I do love reading into it of it being next level. I've been listening to Dissect, that podcast that like goes into the lyrics of a bunch of different music. And I always love when they say something completely wild. And I wonder if the musician listened to the episode and was like, oh, I never thought of that. It's a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. I mean, I have that. There have been songs that I've totally interpreted on my own as a fan and then have later listened to the artist and been like, oh, that's that's not what the song is about. This is completely how I imagined it. <laughs> but yes, the, the yellow shoes speak to Ginny's heart and soul and it's her <laughs> self-expression. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It's what's funny about the shoes and the whole and the headband thing and all of this is that when we have seen fans, fans do an incredible job of cosplaying these characters and what is such a strange mind puzzle is when you see people like I will see people dress up as Ginny at these conventions and they're wearing the yellow shoes and in my mind I'm like oh that has now become staple in this Ginny parody character even though they were just the shoes that were in my closet like it's it's just funny how <laughs> things just become when you don't intend them to <laughs> that's absolutely fantastic i absolutely love it you talked about the costume department i am intrigued about the other departments in it mainly who is the art department because everything that gets drawn is gorgeous from the little cardboard things to the props themselves who is putting them all together because those are beyond me they are truly pieces of art and what you will perhaps not believe, because I still can't believe it, even though I know them very well, Nick and Matt Lang, in addition to being phenomenal comedic geniuses, they are also just effortlessly incredible artists. I think they are completely self-taught. They can draw like nobody's business. And they, in addition to writing it, made all of those props by hand. They're all like cardboard cutouts colored in in magic marker, which like, I've had magic marker since I was five years old and I <laughs> still can't color in the lines and I, they're all streaky. Like their ability to color in magic marker, it confounds me. So it really, that's, that's all their talent. They are truly, especially Nick Lang, because then when you add on top of the fact that Nick Lang is an incredible actor, which you rarely get to see him do, they're so talented. So that is truly, truly all them. For, so specifically for a very Potter musical, then the team started to get bigger as far as getting people to help out and building sets and designing um, as we move into a very Potter sequel and senior year and shows after that. I helped color some of them. Oh, cool. I didn't do any of the, again, my coloring skills are- Yeah, so I was far. gonna say, I did notice some of them were a little streaky in parts. Yeah. So I could see those being your contribution. I will take credit <laughs> for all the coloring mistakes. In fact, <laughs> it's, it's funny you said that because during that first a, a very Potter musical, we would stay up, it was like me, Bonnie Grusin, Darren, Nick and Matt, and Julia Albane. We stayed up like till three in the morning in the upstairs like tech studio, coloring in and like helping piece together these props last minute. And um, I was so delusional because we were doing it at 3 a.m. that there is a prop that made it into the show and has now like the yellow shoes and the headband and the chocolate bar become canon in Star Kid World. I made a typo no. <laughs> on Tom Riddle's gravestone. Instead oh, of writing yeah. Thomas Riddle, it says Thom's Riddle, T-H-O-M-S. <laughs> okay. And it was purely a t delusional at 3 a.m. coloring in a gravestone human made typo <laughs> that then later on I've seen in fan art they've just been like this must have been a choice <laughs> in reality it was me <laughs> and then it became part of the plot of the third one right is they specifically have made his name Tom's it, yes that is probably true because Nick has <laughs> made fun of me for that <laughs> and, I mean that's truly the magic of it it's like mistakes just got wings and flew <laughs> 
<laughs> it's fun that you mentioned names being misspelled because this was my next question as we now go from StarKid questions to more specific to you questions. I love that your name is like the trifecta of being misspelled where I think people <laughs> will misspell Jamie, people will misspell Lynn, and they will misspell. And then I learned before recording, mispronounce your last name of Beatty. So like as someone at my last name, Schubert, the C gets dropped all of the time. People spell Schubes or Schubert with SH and it makes me a little sad, especially when people like reply to Twitter where it like has the name. They're like, shh, shh, shh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what is it like living in a world where like your name is constantly being misspelled and mispronounced? You know, it's funny you mention that because I wake up every day in this world and that is my first question. <laughs> Will my name be butchered? Some people are very precious about their names. It doesn't really phase me. Like little pronunciation things, I will just correct people sometimes, but I I don't really care too much. I don't know. I like to <laughs> I like to make it work for my name. <laughs> Truly nobody has ever asked me this. My full name is actually Jamie Lynn, all one word. Oh, interesting. And it's butchered so often, or this is from me as a child, but it was, I was called J Mellon or like Jamelin. I, for whatever reason that it, it's too much to handle with all those letters. So I split it up and therefore made it three times harder. <laughs> <laughs> and, and for my purposes, do you go by Jamie or Jamie Lynn or? Another just <laughs> very, thank you so much for asking. <laughs> I really, again, I, I could not care less. And it's so funny. I always introduce myself I think as Jamie Lynn, but people naturally gravitate towards Jamie because it's, I get it, it's simpler, it's easier. You can truly call me, call me. I'm okay. here. Call me whatever you want. <laughs> well, I was, I was trying before the interview doing prep. I was like, okay, I should look this up. And <laughs> Gmail was like, it's just Jamie. I was like, yeah, but maybe Gmail does the thing where they don't let you put in a two name, first name kind of thing. So then I went to the StarKid official fandom wiki, which is a whole. That's a thing? Oh, there's a whole. It's like one of those fandom wiki things where people can just post whatever. You should see people have written many nice things about you on the StarKid thing. And it's just bullet after bullet. But yeah, it was interesting changeable of Jamie and Jamie Lynn. So oh, going so into fun. it, I was I'm like, look, I'm just so going to have to ask her. <laughs> no, it's, it just makes you a mystery. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because Siri calls me Jaime, which I love. Oh, no way. Yeah. And a lot of Uber drivers in seeing my name, they call me Jaime. And I just, I just smile and say, yep. Hi, <laughs> that's me. Here I am. <laughs> oh, that's so fantastic. So now's the point in the interview where I get to act like a late night TV host where I pretend something is coming up naturally, but it is in fact pre-planned. Uh, so, Jamie Lynn, uh, is there by any chance, I don't know, like some sort of casting notice that people emailed out when they were first creating the play? Like, do you have anything such as that, just like picking a, a, a specific item like this out of thin air? You know, it's very <laughs> funny you should say that, Mike, because <laughs> our chats inspired me to dive deep into my Facebook message history, which is a dark world, <laughs> especially from the college years when Facebook was the only thing that existed. And I found, I didn't even know I had this, I found the original audition notice that was posted for what eventually became known as a Very Potter musical. Okay. I'm very happy if you just narrate this to I will. the listeners. So, for context, the reason I say it eventually became to be known as a Very Potter musical, it's because originally the show was called Harry Potter colon, the musical. And then didn't Warner Brothers get upset with you all about that? Or was that just... Well, that, this is the whole reason why when the show ran in Ann Arbor initially, it was not known. If you had asked, like, where do I watch a Harry Potter musical? No one would know what you're talking about because only after the fact was it named Right. That. Throughout the initial run, it was called this. So yes, Warner Brothers is to blame. <laughs> we did nothing wrong. They're the ones to blame. <laughs> okay, so this is from January 21st, 2009 go back in time. It says, auditions for Harry Potter, colon, the musical. Harry Potter, the musical, based on J.K. Rowling's classic book series, directed and adapted by Matt Lang. Music by A.J. Holmes and Darren Chris, presented by Basement Arts, April 9th through the 11th. First rehearsal, March 22nd, auditions, Tuesday and Wednesday from 6 to 10, location studio two. And a preface to that is, the show was written by Nick Lang, Matt Lang, and Brian Holden. However, because the Basement Arts was a student-run organization, you had to be a current student in order to apply to do a show. And because Nick and Brian had already graduated, they had to 
amend the casting notice so that it looked like it was only made by current students enrolled at the Ah. the school. So a little loophole to get around it. Okay, audition information. Should you want to audition for Harry Potter? I'd love to. (laughs) (laughs) Well, here's what you got to do. Auditions can be done alone or in groups of two. If auditioning alone, please prepare a monologue, preferably comedic, and a song that can be performed a cappella. If auditioning with a partner, please prepare a short scene. The scene can be from a play, movie, TV show, book, comic, or even a self-written piece. And prepare a duet to perform a cappella. If callbacks are needed, they will take place on February 11th. Show description. Whoa. Now, this is interesting because originally the show, it doesn't sound like a parody in its initial description, which is Fascinating. Show description. Harry Potter is the most miserable, lonely boy you can imagine. He lives with his terrible relatives, the Dursleys, and is forced to stay in the cupboard under the stairs. But Harry's world gets turned around upside down when he is invited to attend Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. At Hogwarts, Harry meets real lifelong friends like Ron Weasley and Hermione Granger and finds magic in everything from classes to aerial sports played on flying brooms. Harry also discovers a great destiny that has been waiting for him. He is the boy who lived, and his fate is forever intertwined with that of the most powerful dark wizard the world has ever known, Lord Voldemort. This play is a musical adaptation of J.K. Rowling's world-renowned book series. Jones in does conflict with this play. If you have any questions, please email us. Uh, okay, so <laughs> was that just the back of the first book <laughs> reading, like the back cover panel, and then added on, this is a musical adaptation of that? <laughs> Quite possibly, yes. It, th- I think that was what struck me the same, where I was like, oh, this isn't funny. And it, <laughs> it's very misleading when you consider what the show was and became. Also, I feel so bad for Jones in just getting slotted against what became a very Potter musical, that is just some tough box office clashing right there. Indeed. Jones and was a basement art show written by a, another student-written show that was very dark, very much the opposite of what AVPM was. And there are a few people who, to this day, I've talked with, and they were like, I wish I hadn't done Jones and. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can't imagine why. <laughs> but Jones and's a wonderful show written by our good friend. It was just funny that that was a, that was a conflict at the time. So what was your audition? I'm so fascinated by the thought of a two-person audition. I don't think I've ever heard of that before. I don't know that I have either. The Langs just wanted to see you play. And that's really, it's like, how much can you make fun of yourself and have fun? And I did a solo audition. I think I sang either a Celine Dion song. Oh, yes. I think I sang that. All coming back oh, to Oh, that's me. good. So so it was a 48-minute audition because that song never ends. <laughs> I think, or I have a very vague memory of singing the opening. Oh, I think I did this. I think I sang the Bell song from Beauty and the Beast, like the Bell reprise, Ooh. but I changed the lyrics to be about Star Wars and or The Last Airbender. And I remember, I oh, this is what I did. And I made a little book with like markers and like made it as though she was like reading about The Last Airbender or Star Wars. I pandered to the Langs in all honesty. I mean, I can see why you got the job. That is some great <laughs> A-plus pandering stuff. <laughs> I be- if I if my memory serves me, that's, that's what I did for my audition. And then I think I did like a monologue that I just, there was like a viral video going around of Miss America pageant where like, the Miss America pageant Oh, the woman. maps one? She like butchers it and she just says gibberish or something. I cannot remember. And I, I like- remember there was a Miss America thing where they asked her some serious question and then she was all about maps and stuff. That might have been it. I just remember I learned it verbatim and I was wow. like, I'm going to do parody of this horrific Miss America speech that makes no sense. In <laughs> hindsight, maybe not the best choice. I don't know what I was thinking. but I mean, clearly this was just the two most logical choices for this very right. serious, not funny Harry Potter musical. Right. <laughs> I know, it's <laughs> shocking. I got <laughs> Indeed, I should have done Brecht or Julius Caesar <laughs> or something with much more bravado and, and pathos, but I didn't. <laughs> Hey, well, you know, hindsight 2020 doesn't matter. You got the job, and here we are, and Jonesen will forever be <laughs> the, <laughs> the sad afterthought. We got to bring Jonesen back. Jonesen needs its time in the sun, for sure. Yeah, maybe, you know, 10 years from now, 
Starkid makes Jones in as the way to bring it all full mm-hmm. circle. They bring in the Jones in cast and it becomes yes. a Starkid production. A very Jones in musical. Yeah, yeah. Would land with <laughs> very few of us, but boy, would we enjoy it. I personally would love a very Jones in musical because I definitely know what it's about. I certainly am familiar with the University of Michigan's theater department plays that they put on. Hey, it's me editing. Mike, how's it going? We got to take a little bit of a break, though. That idea is just so good. I got to think about it for a couple minutes and process that while we take a break for a little segment that we like to call Wind Guardian at Ridosa. Today's episode of Potterless is brought to you by Warby Parker. Let's say hypothetically that you are Harry Potter, and very early on, at least in the movies, your glasses get broken, and you need a new pair of glasses. Where could you get some fresh specs for your face? Warby Parker. Warby Parker is committed to providing exceptional vision care online and in stores, offering eyeglasses, sunglasses, eye exams, and contact lenses. Their glasses start at $95, including prescription lenses. Sunglasses, progressives, and blue light lenses are all also available, so if you want to get some of those blue light ones to make sure that your eyes don't bleed because you're looking at a computer all day every day like me, Warby Parker's got your back. Or I guess your eyes. Their entire home try-on kit process is fantastic and I was able to do it with my dad. So I don't need glasses, but Joel P. Schubert needs glasses for sure and specifically he needed some new ones. So I did the whole try-on thing with him and it was a great process. We looked at some of the glasses online, we downloaded the app and they do a AR thing where they put the glasses on your face so it feels like you're trying them on before you get the five that they ship to you in your box. Then they ship you a box with five of the frames and the colors and the size that you've picked out. You try them all on, you figure out what you like the best, then you tell them and then you can buy those frames. Joel genuinely enjoyed this process so much, I had such a fun time helping him and doing it with him, and he's very excited about his new glasses. And let me tell you, they look fresh, they feel like high quality frames, and the ease of the entire process from start to finish was very simple. So if this sounds interesting to you, you can try Warby Parker's free home try-on program. You get to order five pairs of glasses to try on at home for free for five days. There's no obligation to buy. It ships free and includes a prepaid return shipping label, so it is very, very simple. So try five pairs of glasses on at home for free at warbyparker.com slash potterless, and you can be like Joel P. Schubert today. Today's episode of Potterless is also brought to you by HelloFresh. Let's say hypothetically that you are star kid and you are putting on a very Potter senior year, and boy, oh boy, is it hard for you to get some food. You want to get some food delivered directly to you so that you can cook it up right on the spot. You want a nice meal, but you don't want to go out anywhere. What could you do? You could get some food from HelloFresh. HelloFresh offers fresh, high-quality ingredients every week for a super flavorful experience. And HelloFresh's pre-portion ingredients mean that there's less prep for you and less food waste, so win-win. It's very easy to change your delivery days and your food preferences, and what's also great about HelloFresh is that they donated over 2.5 million meals to charity in 2019, and this year they're stepping it up even more amid the coronavirus crisis. I have made many meals with HelloFresh, and I really appreciate how easy it is, and I also appreciate them broadening my repertoire of recipes. I was pretty much on a one-track mind with the type of tacos that I make, but through HelloFresh I've made multiple different types of tacos, as well as multiple different types of quesadillas. So my Tex-Mex game, even though I'm not living in Texas anymore, is still very strong and I appreciate them for that. So if this sounds interesting to you, you're in luck. You can go to HelloFresh.com slash Potterless80 and use the code Potterless80 to get a total of $80 off, including free shipping on your first box. Additional restrictions may apply. Please visit HelloFresh.com for more details. But again, that URL is HelloFresh.com slash Potterless80 and then use the code Potterless80 to get a total of $80 off. So go to HelloFresh.com slash Potterless80, use the code Potterless80, save 80 bucks and get that food so you can be fueled for your star kid performance today. And finally, today's episode of Potterless is brought to you by Calm. Let's say hypothetically that you are me, Mike Schubert, and you've got three podcasts going on. You're also trying to work out and go on runs and stuff. And you're also trying to make sure you get enough sleep and rest. And how can you help make sure you get that sleep and rest? You can do that with Calm. Calm is the app designed to help you ease stress and get the best sleep of your life. When you relieve anxiety and improve your sleep, you feel better in every single part of your life. Calm has an entire library of programs designed for healthy sleep, like soundscapes, guided meditations, and over a hundred sleep stories narrated by soothing voices like Stephen Fry, Kelly freaking Roland from Destiny's Child, and Laura freaking Dern. 
Calm, you're just continuing to be so up my alley. I love this. Over 85 million people around the world use Calm to take care of their minds and get better sleep. So you can join that group if you go to calm.com slash Potterless and you will get a limited time offer of 40% off a Calm premium subscription, which includes hundreds of hours of programming. So if you get the Calm app, you can experience a transformation in the way you sleep. So for Potterless listeners, Calm is offering a special limited time promotion of 40% off a Calm premium subscription at calm.com slash Potterless. That is 40% off unlimited access to Calm's entire library and new content is added every single week. So get started today at calm.com slash Potterless. Again, C-A-L-M.com slash Potterless. Get that wonderful audio to help you sleep smoothly and quickly and soundly. And you can actually get some sleep when you have the chance to Mike Schubert, who is doing a whole lot of stuff today. So specifically going into your roles in the trilogy, There are many things that I like a whole lot, but I think my favorite is, aside from the singing, of course, is your ability to be possessed Ginny and look like you were unable to, like, walk, but also so artfully stumble. How was it being possessed by Voldemort for an entire play? (laughs) Because it it looked challenging. Honestly, it's the best I've ever felt. I would recommend (laughs) it to anyone. It was really fun. I love physical comedy. I think because I have a background in improv that started off in college with short form improv and then eventually moved to long form improv as many improvisers are wont to do. I have always loved with pretty much any character I get, just fully committing to whatever it is. So much so that I, it's funny that Ginny was possessed in that moment. Cause like, I feel like when I'm on stage, I enter a completely different side of myself. That's why I love being an actor. Cause I, I'm, I'm still figuring out who I am as as we we all are. are. That is a life process. But what's so wonderful about being in a show is you get to just fully immerse yourself in someone else and commit to that make-believe. And so I think playing Possessed Ginny, I was just like, oh, this is my ticket to ride in this world of confusion and being possessed by the evilest creature (laughs) in the universe. And I just had fun with it. I I like to have as much maximum fun as possible with my characters as possible. Yeah, it definitely shows in the play. I think there is no better evidence of that than when Voldemort calls you to call the snake and you do the (laughs) thing. (laughs) I lost it at that point. It was probably my favorite part of the whole thing, just especially (laughs) because the framing in the YouTube video that you're off to the side and you're a little faded. So just to see you fully eyes bulged out (laughs) with like the... (laughs) It was wonderful facial work. (laughs) It was very solid. I liked Uh. it quite a bit. (laughs) So going between Ginny and Rita Skeeter, I think something that puts the two together is that the wigs for both of them are quite astounding. The Rita wig specifically was such a shape. Is Is there like a hat underneath it? I'm looking at it, it's just the beehiviest of beehive hairdos, and it, it looks like a feat of faux hair. Uh, it is 100% faux. You must not be a wig man, because... Oh, I'm not at all. I've <laughs> I've never really done it, and the only, like, I, my only acting stuff is, is improv and specifically all the improv stuff that I did was a no-props theater, where they were like, rather than have props that look bad, everything's just going to be pantomimed. So I have very, very little experience with props and wigs. <laughs> because you've given that wig a lot of credit. It was I, I, like an Amazon. If that was a thing back oh, then, wow, was that a okay. thing? It was like a polyester, you know, shiny wig, beehive shape. So no, there was nothing under it. I don't think, except I think it was built to be tall. Like okay. that. I will say, and this is very important with all of the costuming, starting with um, a Harry Potter sequel, we had incredible help from talented costume designer, June Saito, Yonit, Olshin, if I believe I'm pronouncing her name correctly, Corey Lubowicz helped with costumes. Like we were able to pull from the University of Michigan costume stock and work with people who were majoring in theatrical costuming. So they were able to, for lack of a better term, zhuzh. Oh, uh, it's a perfect term. No, that is wigs. the best term. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I was, I, whenever I have the opportunity to throw Yiddish into my life, I will 
<laughs> I will take that up. So yeah, she, I mean, I remember they, I actually have it on my fridge still, the um, the little mm-hmm. hair piece that was a peacock feather. And they have an incredible talent, not just to build costumes from scratch, but take something that is basic and zhuzh it up. It looked great. I, I, you really made it work. They made it work. They, they did a sorry, great job. yes, they, they made it work. I, I think they did a fantastic job. It, it looks ridiculous. I guess because the second one was before and Ginny wasn't at the school, was it fun for you to play a different character? What was it like in terms of being one of the most staple characters in Harry Potter? And then you're making a sequel and then you go, oh, I have to be someone new. What was it like for you trying to, like, were you involved in picking Rita? Like, how did it all come about to be, oh, I got to be in the play, but I can't be the person that I just was? Sure. I will say, like, with all of the Starkid castings, as a cast member, we don't have any say in what roles we are given. It's okay. only recently did they kind of start auditioning up until that. And even auditions, I feel like they know in advance who they want for the roles, but um, Starkid has always taken elements of our personality and caricatured them. If we, if there was like a cartoon version of an aspect of each of our personalities, I think they've all kind of seeped into a lot of those characters. And so, you know, playing Ginny was super fun because I got to tap into this idea of an annoying little sister, which my original note for it which I realized the character is written to be very annoying. I, I My initial inspiration was Randy from A Christmas Story, if oh, you know that yeah, reference. yeah, yeah, yeah. The, like, an obnoxious little brother <laughs> that is just a little gnat that kind of flies around all the time and is annoying. To be honest, I'm, a, I'm an only child, and I didn't really have a... I didn't have a sister or brother experience to pull from, so I was just like, yeah. Brothers and sisters are extra annoying. And so I just (laughs) rode with that. And so I think in contrast, to answer your question, when I got to play Rita, I was able to be like, oh, now I can be, I can rein that in and tap into this other planet that I go to. When I play characters, I like to imagine that I go to a planet and I live on that planet for a while as that character. I don't even understand it. It, Anyway, it was fun (laughs) for me to, to then go to Rita world and be like, oh, this woman is very composed and very much has her shit together compared Mm -hmm. to poor little lost Ginny. (laughs) Poor little lost Ginny. I do think one of the most fun moments for me when I was watching the first one was going from Ginny, like you said, being very much the archetype of bratty, annoying little sister. Pushover little sister. Like she's just, she's really been Delta. (laughs) <laughs> a rough hand. <laughs> a rough hand, especially since Ron and Harry in these plays are specifically, have amped up the hate, being the older brother that hates his sister kind of thing. Like, that's very much played up. But I think it's fun to have Ginny switch from doing that to whenever you first sing, because your singing voice is incredibly powerful. So I think it's funny to have Ginny go from being like, oh, it's me, Ginny, to like, especially in Not Alone, where it's like soulful, like bluesy, like <laughs> Harry. <laughs> I thought it was just a fun dichotomy between, like, Ginny speaking and Ginny singing is, like, a whole different, like, aura. Yeah, I mean, I I certainly had fun with it. It's, I, you know, I, I love characters. I love doing characters. I love trying these different parts of myself and having fun. And, yeah, it's, it's, it's a fun adventure to go on down the Ginny road versus the Rita Skeeter road. They're good roads. Different, very different roads. Quite different roads. But, you know, it's just showing the range. You can be (laughs) Tiny Sister and very confident, bad journalist (laughs) Rita Skeeter. (laughs) Plus that Rita Skeeter costume. I love costumes, and I find them to be very helpful in transforming into characters. And that Rita Skeeter costume, it was like a wool cape that they pulled from the costume stock. And, like, it had so many details in it that I was just like... I felt regal and... <laughs> also, your quill pen the feather was, I think, 12 feet long, maybe? <laughs> uh, I think it was 13.75 feet. Oh, thank you th- yes, for the clarification. Yes, yes. <laughs> I was watching it back today. I was like, that is a huge quill. <laughs> They did a good job with those props. It was very fun. It's, v- it's very fun. From what I've been told... My understanding is that when you filmed the first one, it was purely just so you could show your friends and family, right? Correct. And ourselves, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So obviously you had no plans of this becoming what it was, like you had said. Was there one big thing that made it explode? Was it like some big particular person shared it or was it just a gradual thing? Like how do you go from, oh, we basically made this home movie that does live on YouTube to tens and hundreds of thousands of people have now watched this and now we're going to make a second one. Basically to explain, we did the show and then because 
we were all in Ann Arbor for college and the nature of college is everyone lives around the country. We all then went back to our respective homes to wait for the beginning of the school year to come around again. And in that time that we were all no longer together was when they put the musical up. And part of the reason why they put the musical up on YouTube was because the shows that we had done in Basement Arts in Ann Arbor for ourselves, they'd been a hit within our microcosm of Ann Arbor. Like there were even lines outside of Studio One where we did the show of just local people in Ann Arbor who had heard about the show because Harry Potter was so big, it already had a built-in fandom. So I think people were just tickled to see a Harry Potter musical. And so because it had just had enough of a fun response and we enjoyed it, it was such a a, one, a wonderful four-day journey for us. We were like, man, I want to show mom and dad, you know, what I did this summer. <laughs> so YouTube was a new platform and we put it up that summer and then We were just all chiming in with like, oh my gosh, it got posted here. Guys, check out this link. Got posted in an article in the UK. And I think, to circle back to Melissa and Ellie, the first I have from, this is evidence, June 21st, uh, 2009, Melissa and Ellie posted something on theexaminer.com. Okay, yeah, that's a legit site. And it was (laughs) Melissa, I really really would say that Melissa and Ellie is to credit with a lot of this because she also had her Leaky Cauldron Mm -hmm. podcast then Mm -hmm. and brought us into the fold of all the cons. So that was one of them. It was just, I mean, what's very cute about being able to look back, I guess, thank you, Facebook. I rarely say that, but thank (laughs) you, Facebook, for keeping (laughs) Not deleting my decade-old message. (laughs) Not terrifying. (laughs) But yeah, I mean, you know me, I love nostalgia. It was it was fun for me to go back and it, it's just the root of all of this was so pure and it's really sweet to see all these, all of us chiming in with like, look what I found here. Oh, wow, it's being posted here. And at one point, I remember the soundtrack was posted in a comment on the original video that people could just download. And among this little group of like seven of us were like, make sure that, you know, hold on to the soundtrack because like, we don't know what we're going to do with it. And we were all just kind of scrambling because we didn't intend for it to be seen outside of our little microcosm. So I think it was, it was interesting to have everyone kind of excitedly share the reaches of the musical that they had been stumbling upon. That's really cool. Also is, are there crows crawling in the background? Can you hear those? Yeah. I don't know if it'll be on the audio, but this is like giving an ominous vibe to this interview. <laughs> That's so spooky. We've awakened the <laughs> the demons of there Harry are, Potter. <laughs> there are literally murderers outside of my window. <laughs> who who the hell came up with the name of let's name a group of crows murders? Like a crows genius. are already creepy enough. <laughs> an absolute genius. Have you seen a crow in person? I recently saw one up close. I don't think I've gotten close to one. They are huge. They are, their head is the size of a toaster. Their body is the size of like a, 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 a I don't even know, a, a blender. A blend, a printer. <laughs> Bigger than a blender. Okay. It's like a toaster on top of a printer. I'm looking at both of those things right now. <laughs> and, and it, the the beak, it's very scary. I think it makes sense why they called it a murder because it, it truly looks like the most ominous creature in the, the world. The beak is the size of two spatulas. I just imagine Correct. all of your... All- <laughs> <laughs> All of your sizes of measurements are just appliances and kitchen utensils. Throw the metric system and, and oh um, yeah, to get to my house, um, you're just want, you're gonna want to drive 58 refrigerators and yeah. then take a right. <laughs> then you'll yes. go six kitchen islands. <laughs> yeah, I am two vacuums and one telephone call. <laughs> oh. So something that I find interesting and something I find inspiring with Star Kid is to see how far you have grown in so many different ways in terms of just the size and the number of people involved to the productions you've done, but also just the growth of the plays that you're producing from making shows where you don't have to apologize for jokes when you're making shows that appeal to a wider audience and are being inclusive. I think it's inspiring to see you grow as a theater company just because, like you said, this was all accidental. None of it was planned. So what's it like to be in a group where you are actively just kind of figuring it out as you go and growing in many different regards while you're doing so? I think the beauty and the curse of Star Kid is that in its nascent stage as a Harry Potter musical, we never intended for it to go beyond the four days that we put it up. And so I as a big fan of um, nostalgia, I've always just assumed everything was the last 
time that we would do something or the last time we would see each other. And so we're always doing it with with our heart and soul because this might truly be the last time that we get an opportunity to do this. Um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm forever grateful for the opportunities that we get to continue to do more shows and the fans have been so wonderful and, and supportive of all of the work that we've done both in StarKid and outside as we've all branched out and done other other work. Um, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question again? I'm getting Oh, it was, verklempt. again, it was, it was, <laughs> it was a very not one direct, it's just, it seems like Starkid has grown in a lot of different ways. And I think it's interesting to be a part of something that grows in so many different ways and like, especially coming from a place where it's unplanned. Because even I know uh, Devin just put up a YouTube video recently where she basically apologized for the whole Cho Chang thing and just realizing we were college kids and we had no idea that this is something that was going to grow to what it was. And if we could do it all over again, we totally would have changed that. So I, I feel like it's it's an interesting place to be where it was started from a place that you didn't expect and it got so big and then you just kind of had to figure it out as you keep going. Yeah, I think there's there's a, a quote that's like, um, and I don't know who says it, but you don't get to choose what you're famous for. And I think that kind of sums up Star Kid. And we, we jokingly call ourselves Oops Fuck Productions, where it's like, <laughs> we did something, oops fuck, now we have to like make up for it. Um, but uh, yeah, I think obviously it very much is a show that existed in a specific time in our lives. In 2009, the world was a very different place. Um, we were all very different people. I think, you know, I was 20 or 21 years old. And, and it's funny that that moment in time has been captured in a little bubble and then thrown to the world to see. And it's kind of like, you know, had we had we known? Not that I, I don't think we would have done it differently, but I think there's something so pure about it just being something that we did for ourselves that it's really special that it kind of has grown beyond us. And I've always said that Star Kid is not just the people that are in the group, but it is so much larger than all of us. And it is made up of fans from all over the world. And I'm still in awe of the community and the people that that make up the world that is Star Kid. It's like people, you are a Star Kid whether you like it or not, if you've just consumed our shows. <laughs> so yeah, it's been special to to get to to grow with the shows and and yeah, I get to get to kind of slip into these different worlds of the of the different plays. Yeah, that's really fun. Now talking about everything ending and the last time, never knowing when it was, the last time that at least you did the Harry Potter stuff was a Harry Potter senior year. And we had Melissa on and she talked about from her perspective as someone who put on LeakyCon what the show was like. But I would love to hear from your side of it, being a member of the cast in what can only be described as as a beautiful tornado of a theater production. What was it like being a part of such a wonderful, hectic, but incredibly emotional and really fun musical that was put together in quite a strange manner? What was it like being a part of it? <laughs> um, indeed, the Barry Potter senior year was especially special um, because it was the first time that we really brought back everyone who had ever touched a Star Kid production um, up until that point. And um, much like the Star Kid Homecoming show where we just did, we just opened the doors. We were like, if you've been a part of this, come join us with open arms. Welcome, welcome back. And I think, especially for me as someone who just is a sucker for nostalgia and is constantly prematurely mourning the end of things, especially the song Everything Ends, which to this day I think is my favorite song in the entire Star Kid canon that Clark Backstrasser and Pierce Siebers wrote. Um, I have such a distinct memory and a video on my phone of, um, <laughs> I collect videos. I'm a hoarder. Uh, again, I'm a hoarder of memories. Same. Oh, same. My, my phone is constantly yelling at me to clear up space and it's solely photos and videos. Yeah. So I have a video on my phone of us all backstage in our costumes, Joe dressed as Voldemort. We all look ridiculous and we're all just sobbing, singing the backup vocals to Everything Ends because the energy in that room, there were, I think like 5,000 people in that yeah, I think so. Convention room. And that in and of itself was so surreal because up until that moment, the Star Kid fan base had only really existed online. And so to get to 
see people. To this day, it blows my mind when I see real humans who have watched the show because doing a show that for the most part exists online, obviously we perform it in front of a small live audience, but I'm still like, I'm like, you're real? Like these, I can't believe that there are real <laughs> humans who are on the other end of the computer. And so it was it was so special to see 5,000 people who were there supporting and and laughing and and relishing in the joy and the memories that we also were feeling because again it's so much bigger than just us like star kid to me is the whole fandom so yeah it was it was special it made it was bittersweet like it was really beautiful yeah the crowd i think <laughs> as i mentioned in a previous episode i think that the crowd in a very Potter senior year is one of the best elements of the play you can just feel the emotion even though there's no Netflix, HBO special with zoom ins of people in the crowd, like you can still feel the emotion that they're feeling. And even though you're not there, just from their reactions, you can feel that emotion. And I know it's this like theater schmutery thing to be like, oh, the crowd really brought out a performance. But like, I think it's a legitimate thing that happened in that play. And it's something that I've felt before, but you can so tell that that was something, especially when you get to that final scene when you're all saying goodbye to Harry and stuff. Ah. It's real. <laughs> it's, it is real. And I, I do have to give a personal shout out to my husband who we had just been dating at the time, not as husband and, and wife, but as um, <laughs> as fresh young lovers. Hello, would you like to be my husband? <laughs> <laughs> no, just dating as my husband. Um, he, uh, he, that was the first introduction he had to Star Kid, and he sat through that. I think it was a five-hour show, and like he was somebody who did not have any point of reference for this. And I was just like, so on top of the fact that there were people there who knew the show and and had been had grown up with us, there were also those those few souls in the audience who were like, "What is this?" and Kudos to them for sitting through it because that that is truly they are the real heroes of they're the troopers the uh, very Potter senior year. <laughs> oh man! Well, I can't think of a better place to round out this interview is talking about such a, a wholesome moment that is the final moments of a very Potter senior year. So, Jamie Lynn, Jaime Lynn, Jamalain, thank you so much for coming on and doing this little interview. This was such a fun thank time. Thank you so much for having me, Mike Schubert. Shh, it's a secret. It's <laughs> very secret. If people want to find you doing stuff, obviously they can search for Star Kid things. But have you been up to any any things in the whole quarantine? You can't do a show with thousands of people in the crowd because that wouldn't be smart world. Before quarantine hit, I was part of a new musical called Glass Ceilings, which is a rock musical um, that tells the story of female pioneers throughout history. That's really cool. It's such an amazing show. The music is super catchy and it tells these stories of women who admittedly I had never heard of myself. Oh, what's we... this? History books only talk about <laughs> white men? No way! <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> Indeed. it's It couldn't be more appropriate um, given the, the the unfortunate events unfolding in our world. But um, we were in the middle of a run right when the pandemic hit and we have since been able to uh, remotely record a cast album. So that's been cool. Really really fun and, and lovely to work on during all this. So yeah. Where can people find that? It will eventually make its way to the www dots, ah. the HTTPs, the, the internet at large, I'm sure. <laughs> the colon slash slash. <laughs> <laughs> I think because StarKid works so fast, I am constantly reminded like, oh yeah, in the rest of the world, things move at a much slower pace. So it'll, it'll eventually be. <laughs> out there. I also recently launched a Patreon, which has been a literal lifesaver during quarantine, um, as well as just a really wonderful, freeing, creative outlet for all these ideas I've always had in my head that I've been too afraid to do on my own. Now that I have this wonderful community, I'm I'm less afraid to be my my strange creative self. That's wonderful. And yeah, if people want to find you, I guess they can just try their best at spelling your name and hopefully something will pop up. Just throw something into Google and cross your fingers and hope. <laughs> I'm on Instagram a lot these days. That is the only thing I have time for. The internet terrifies me. There are too many things. There are too many platforms. I, it's it's very scary for a 32-year-old. It's okay. Facebook's buying all of them, so eventually you won't have to think. Great. Take it all. And on Instagram, my handle is at JL Beatty, so you don't even have to worry about butchering my first name. You can just type in the last name and cross your fingers and... Uh, <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> JLB, thank you for joining on the podcast. I appreciate it. Listeners, thank you for listening. And as they say in the wizarding world of Harry Potter, before they put on yellow shoes, 
haphazardly, which then become distinctive and very important uh, channels to what my inner emotions are. (laughs) Wizard on! Hey, are you caught up on Potterless, but you want more of podcasts that are made by me and are similarly very fun and nostalgic? Well, one of my other podcasts, Meddling Adults Season 2, is dropping this week, if you're listening the week of September 9th, because on September 9th, Season 2 of Meddling Adults launches. We raised over $750 for charity in Season 1. We're trying to stomp that in Season 2. We've recorded a bunch of episodes. It's very fun. I'm very excited. You can listen to the Season 2 trailer right now, and you can listen to all episodes of the show over at meddlingadults.com, or just search Meddling Adults wherever you listen to your podcast. Potterless was created by Mick Schubert. It is hosted by Mick Schubert. It is edited by Mick Schubert. It is produced by Mick Schubert as well as Vicky Garcia, Christine, Aaron Johnson, Klaus Lopu, Marchismo, Samantha Rose, Juan Sanfeliu, Rosemary Dodge, Maria Lisa C. Keen, Romina Rivadanira, Audra, Eleanor Curlin, Nikita Power, Ali Madsen, Sarah Nink, Rachel Guthrie, Zachary Polito, Orchid Grower, Vivian the Owl, Moster, Alex Consolver, John Cocker, Noel Basile, Brandon Pickens, Claire Spencer, Rory Collier, Veronica Bartova, Lada Bartova, Noah, Tracy Toya, Colleen, Jennifer Mark Lou, Justin Montero, Jacob Parrish, Maya Gray, Mark Body, Polly Burge, Zena Rosnowski, Harlan Haskins, Noelia, Nikki. Harris, Kine, Amanda Alford, Kafir Shal TL, Sarah Shatter, Marta Morris, and Maya, Flor Sake, Siri Scaros for Georgia Davis, Skyla Lily, Edel Ryan, Professor Threat, Ellie Hoskov Chova, Michael David Yordi, Kelly Otilio, Kerry Crumpler, Connie Beankowski, Jen Went, Nedry OS, Will Huser, Samantha Lentz, Aurora Fruhoff, Marco Cepeda, Marie Rieger, Ashton Gabrielson, Brittany Gutierrez, Phelan, The Meadows Family, Ginny from the Block, Heather Langeel, Brianna Cusimano, Kevin Stewart, Lori McDonald, Chrissy Tew, Charles Fiven, Peter McGrath, Sophie Duda, Jen and Rose Dab, Callahan and Darius, Leah Reed, Melissa, Rob Bella Barlack, Melanie Demi, Becca Spry, Reese Dignan, Adam Graham, Joseph Torp, Lily's Mom, T Run Money, Madison, Don't Call Me an Infidora, Sabrina Balsiger, Sophia Loves Pigs, Farzan Jarabat, Melanie De Grave, Matt Barger, Okamahime, Boney Pony, Kelsey Gillespie, Rike Mangor Jensen, Taylor Payne, Rachel Mobbs, Megan Moon, Alicia Chapman, Riley Kiddess, Laurel Happy, Ross Ann Batamana, Eric Butler, Miranda, Landon Schwausch, Kendra Hertz, Natanya Page, Yogan Shanley, Darcy Alexander Harrison, Sandra Rose, Craig McRoberts, Andren Kaufman, Steve Trelor, Leo Nachum, Julia Buzak, Demi Lynn, Michelle Spurgeon, Calista Delano, Love Kesh Longer, Jennifer Terzi, and Crystal Pollard, Henrique Wolf, Jeremy Elmore, Delkis, Katrina Smith, Jerrica Law, Casey Canales, Megan Stempen, Scott, Jack Skitzes, Sophia Lyon, Dane Nemcher, Rochelle Unatmaz, Kirsty, Robin Garcia, Chick Parm, Mermaid and her Daddykins, Aaron Ugas, Not My Daughter, You Biatch, Ilaria Vicentin, Lori, Gregory Hughes, Crystal Lee, Caw Caw, Mother Feathers, Nina Jazalek, Riven Monstrosity, Brittany Harper, It's Definitely Ludo Bagman, Ashley Somers, Grant Sohn, Your Friendly Neighborhood Ravenclaw, Gavin Miller, Aliyah Eltar Shobi, Jack Parr, Serenity Allen, Emily Quinlan, Haley Hastings, Sabrina Casanova, Malfoy, You Little Shit, Sean Allen, Jenny Browers, Laura, Ella Levy, Eileen Gazesh, Annette Pipitone, Kirsten R. Cunningham, and Peltzer, Steamed Nuggets, and Kurt R. Potter. Web design by Kelly Schubert, and the music is by Bettina Campamandas. If you want to find us on social media, you can at facebook.com slash Potterless, twitter.com slash Potterless pod, instagram.com slash Potterless podcast, and reddit.com slash r slash Potterless. For any and all information about the show, you can go to Potterlesspodcast.com. For bonus content, you can go to patreon.com slash Potterless. And for merch, you can go to Potterlesspodcast.com slash merch. If you want to tell someone about the show, you think of a family member or a friend who would really like it, why don't you shoot them a message and say, hey, there's a show Potterless. I think you would like it. Or you can leave a rating and review online. Both of those help. Thank you so much for listening. And until next time, as I say in the wizarding world of Harry Potter, who was on?